This morning I was thinking, I was like, how long have I known Jonathan? I'm like, I'm 43, and I just realized just now, no, I'm, I'm not. I'm 45. Um, and I... <laughs> I feel it sometimes, but I chose, and, and, I, I don't, and my, my sermon today, the title of it is The Truth About God and Suffering. There are some sufferings in life that we choose on our own. Like, I chose to run a half marathon, and in choosing to run a half marathon, I chose that every single day for about 10 weeks that I was going to choose to run a certain number of miles every single week. Because you have to build up to run a total of 13.1 miles or something like that. And I chose to run what's called the Whiskey Row Marathon. The Whiskey Row is in Prescott, Arizona. It is one of the most, it's one of the top 10 most difficult marathons in America, which I did not know when I chose it. I chose it because it's in Prescott. Prescott is nice weather in Arizona. If you, you probably have heard about Phoenix weather. It gets a little hot there. It gets hot here in Riverside too, um, but I think we've got you beat a little bit. Um, Prescott, though, is nice. And so I chose to run it. Now, at the end of that run, I felt the pain of my choice in suffering. Now, you, you, all of you who live here in California, you also choose suffering every single day. Here's the choice you've made. You've chose to stay here in California and drive in traffic that is ridiculous. My son and I have been driving through this. You know, it says you're going seven miles away, and it's going to take you an hour and a half to get there. And I look going, and I told Jonathan, I said, it says, so we were in, we went deep sea fishing, my son and I, and it's going to take us three hours to get here. I did not pass a single car accident. I did not pass debris in the road. I did not pass construction. It's solely the amount of people on the roads. You choose that suffering every day. There are different sufferings that we choose that we're okay with. But I did not choose losing my house in 2008. I, I did not choose almost losing my son in 2017. In 2017, my family and I, we went on a mission trip to India. I took all my kids and my wife. We spoke at a, a conference. My son got sick, and he was in the hospital. Nobody knew what was going on. His, you, you heard of the CDC? And they do like things. I get a call from the CDC and they say, so your child has very bad things in their blood. Where have you been? Because they want to know like, did you eat at Chipotle? Did you eat at like Walmart? Did you eat a salad at Walmart? Like, do we need to tell somebody that they need to get rid of all this food? I said, well, my first word was I was in India. And then they said, oh, okay. You don't need to know anything else? No, it's fine. But I, I didn't choose that suffering. I didn't choose losing loved ones, but I went through those dark moments of suffering. You see, we don't mind choosing our suffering when we know that it's going to benefit us. I didn't mind choosing to run the half marathon because at the end of it, I knew, hey, I, I got a medal. <laughs> a medal. <laughs> but what if I could have seen at the end of every suffering I go through, what if, what if I could see the whole picture of the suffering? What if I could see the good that will come from it? Now, I'm going to be honest. I have not seen all the good of all the suffering I've walked through yet. There are some sufferings that I'm still looking, going, okay, God, what good can come of this? You see, God has a plan that will benefit us in our sufferings. With God, suffering is part of the process. It's in the suffering that God is able to give us the comfort that we need. You see, the world can't outsuffer God's comfort. It can't. The world cannot outsuffer God's comfort. But God can outcomfort the world's suffering. The world will bring it, but God brings more comfort every day single day. 
And, and this is God and, and comfort and being able to out comfort what the world brings you. It, it didn't make sense in the, in the old world when, when, when God chose and allowed his son to come to earth and to die. What happened was God, the way that they chose to kill Jesus was what's called the cross. And the cross was the way the world made to, to make the most suffering of a human being possible. You didn't die from the pain. You didn't die from the injury. You ended up dying from suffocation. And the world created this way of suffering and this way that Jesus died. But suffering and death for Jesus meant comfort and salvation for us. This doesn't make sense, but it's what God used. So how can comfort and suffering be related? We all suffer, don't we? We all go through hard times. So what do we do? Here, here's what I want you to know. Here's what I want you to know. I want you to know that comfort can be found in all suffering. By the end of today, I want you to know that comfort can be found in all suffering. And in that comfort, in that comfort, God uses it to help others. So in that comfort that God gives you, He's going to use it to help others. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning. God, I thank you for being such a good God who loves us, who cares for us, and has a great plan for us. And God, I ask that you would minister to us and meet us here in this moment. God, that, that we would see you, see your hand in the hard and difficult times that we go through. And God, I, I just ask that, um, Lord, that if we're going through something now, if we're, we're going through a hard time, difficult time, we're going through that suffering, may we see how faithful and true you are. Jesus, may your word come alive. May it be living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. In Jesus' name, in your name we pray. All God's people said. Amen. Well, hey, good morning. My name is Jeremiah. Um, I'm the pastor at City View Church in Phoenix, Arizona, and it is an honor and a privilege for me to be able to come here. My son and I are what, on what is called a do trip. When my, mo- when my boys, I have three boys. Joel is my middle. He's 14. Um, I have a 16-year-old, and I have a 10-year-old. When my boys turn 14, they get to go on a do trip. And on that do trip, we talk about what it is to be a man. Um, and so the four things that we talk about on the strip is the first thing, a man rejects passivity. That's a man. A man um, accepts responsibility. A man leads courageously. And a man looks to the greater reward. And so that's today's point. That's not today's church point. But that's like as Joel and I are going to be driving, we're going to talk about what does it mean to be a man who looks to the greater reward, not for the immediate satisfaction of something, but looks that looks to what's better in the future. So those are the four things that we talk about. And then we do dude stuff. We went deep sea fishing, um, and we caught two fish, and that was fun. Um, we wanted to catch more, but we didn't. We went to the drag races yesterday. <clears throat> that was a ton of fun. Super loud. We went the past two days to the drags in Pomona. Um, and so we've had a lot of, uh, just a great time being together, just the two of us. Um, my wife, Laramie, is at home with the kids. The other two, uh, she, we've been married for 23 years. I've been a pastor for, I don't know, uh, since 2005 or something like that. Jonathan and I have been friends for almost 20 years now. It's crazy looking back at just all the things, and just it's, it's just an honor to be here with you. So that's a little bit about me. Um, City View Church, we started it. We started in a movie theater. It's a super similar story to Relevant. Um, and then last year, God provided a property that we were able to purchase. And so, and then this, I'm out here this week because I'm on a dude trip, and Jonathan and Pauline are so nice to let us stay with them and save me some money. And uh, <clears throat> just having a great time. So, But we are going to be looking at this idea of suffering. Not a fun topic, is it? But it's real because we all go through it. Whether you choose it or not, it happens and it'll blindside you. So as, as we look through this, I, I want us to now have this understanding of, of, of suffering. Nobody, nobody understands suffering like Jesus. Nobody knows how to comfort us through suffering like God. This doesn't make suffering go away, but it allows us to know that God gets us. Paul gives us some amazing truths in the book of 2 Corinthians. 
This morning, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. So if you brought your Bible, turn there. If you have your phone, open it up to the YouVersion Bible app. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. If you don't own a Bible, I'm going to tell you, get one. If you, don't ha- if you need one, Pauline or Scott, somebody, they will give you one. I, I, I shared this last service. I shared it at City View all the time. How many of you have ever had one of these die on you? But I've never had this die on me. So get one of these. I don't know what it is about the scriptures, but having this, but man, there's so much comfort. Second Corinthians chapter one, first truth. So we're looking at the truths about God and suffering. The first truth is mercy and comfort originate with God, from God. Mercy and comfort originate from God. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Paul uses this word, blessed be the God and Father. This word, blessed be. This phrase is used three different times in the New Testament. This is one of them. Another one of the times, Paul says it in Ephesians chapter 1, and he says in verse 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. This word blessed means praise. Praise as I'm going through the suffering. Praise as I'm going through the hard time. Praise as I'm going through life. Praise God for the past is what Paul says here in Ephesians chapter 3. Praise God for the past. And then Peter uses the same phrasing in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope to, attain, to obtain an inheritance. Peter says, praise God for the future. Praise God for the past. Peter says, praise God for the future. And then Paul says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all mercies and the God of all comfort. Praise the God of the present. You see, when our focus is on praising God as we're walking through the sufferings and the trials of life, it helps us stay focused. When our praise is on him, we praise him for the past, we praise him for the future, we praise him for the present, we're able to see he's the God of all comfort. So it says, praise be, blessed be the God and Father of all comfort, of the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all mercies and the God of all comfort. This word God, this word Father here, it's not like, you're, it's not the word for dad, It's the word for originator. It's the word for the first one. It's a word for it's where it began. It's the word like the OG. God is the OG, the originator, the first one of mercies. God is the OG, the originator. Everything came from him. He's the God of all comfort. That's what this is. This is who he is. This is his DNA. This is this is God. It is who he is to his core. It's what flows out of him. He's the God of mercy. He's the God of all comfort. He's not the God of some comfort. He's not the God of most comfort. He's the God of all comfort. You see, when we walk through trials, when we walk through hard times, when we walk through the sufferings, which we all do, how many of you have walked through suffering before? Not the ones you choose, like going to the gym or running a marathon, but you walk through the sufferings of life, of losing a job, losing a loved one, walking through sickness, losing a house, a financial decision, you name it, you've walked through that suffering. God, being the God of all comfort, comes alongside us and helps us. It's, 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 It's everything about him. And this word comfort, Scott, could I get you to come on up here? See, I think so many times when we think of the word comfort, we think of the, the term like, hey, Scott, are you okay? Scott, you know, I know you're going through a lot of hard times right now, and I just, you know, I just do you need a hug. And we just think it's that coddling comfort. You guys know that? That's not this word here. This word comfort is, Scott, you Okay. I know you're going through it. You okay? Okay, Scott, we can't stay here. We've got to go over there. So let's go, but we're going to go together. 
We're going to go to, that's this word. God, the God of all comfort, he says, hey, you know what? I love you. He does, there are those moments where he comes alongside and he, he like it says in Psalm 116, verse 2, I think it is, and God inclines his ear. He bends down and li- there are those moments. But this term here is God says, hey, Scott, I'm here. We're here. We're going to go. We're going to keep going. We're going to keep moving. God is the God of all comfort. Thank you so much. Scott. So that first truth, mercy and comfort originate from God. He is the God of all comfort. He's the God that's gonna, that walks alongside us and keeps us going. He doesn't let us stay in our past because he's got a future for us. So he says, let's keep going. Some of us, we get stuck here. That's not who we are. We are who God says we are. So that's the first truth. Mercy and comfort originate. It's who he is. They originate from God. The second truth, your suffering is never wasted with God. How many of you have ever felt like your suffering was wasted? How many of you have ever felt like, what in the world was that for? Any of you ever felt like that? God, why did I have to walk through that? Let's read. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4, and then 6 and 7. Verse 5 is truth number 3. Verse 4. Who comforts us, speaking of God, the originator, the originator, God, who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. But if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation Or if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which is effective in the patient enduring of the same suffering, which we also suffer. Verse 7. And our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that as you are sharers of our suffering, so also are you, or you are sharers of our comfort. Paul uses this term affliction or trouble multiple times here. It's the idea to be weighed down, to be exceedingly pressed, to be weighed down exceedingly, to be pressed, to be crushed. How many of you have ever felt that before when you're going through a hard time? Afflicted. Not beat up, but the pressures, the weight, the struggle of life, the the stress of bills, the stress of of parenting, the, the stress of singleness, the stress of life. You just feel those stresses, and they're coming in around you like, when is it ever going to let up? Paul says, I've been there. I've been in that moment. It's the, uh, this idea of affliction or troubles. It's the idea of an animal carrying a load too heavy for itself, which in that culture they would have seen. But we all have carried loads way too heavy for ourselves, haven't we? We all have walked through life carrying loads way too heavy for ourselves. We all have gone through sufferings, hard times that, that we're not meant just for you to carry. You know, there's that, how many of you have ever heard that Bible verse, God will never give you more than you can handle? You guys ever heard that verse? It's not a Bible verse, it's a lie. God will always give you more than you can handle. Sorry for some of you, I just, may I, you just like, that stinks. It's the truth. He will always give you more than, he can, than you can handle, but he will never give himself more than he can. God will never waste your sufferings. You know, there, my wife, she, while my son and I are gone, she took it upon herself to clean our den. Our den is also the home. So my, this son is homeschooled. I, I have three boys. One's in, he goes to high school, public high school. Joel's homeschooled. My other son goes to like a charter school. So we do all of it. So for those of you who are young parents trying to figure out what to do with your kids, do what's best for them. And if it doesn't work in that moment, change it and do something different. You have free, you can do, it's your kids. It's nobody else's. So we do what's best for each one of our kids. So our homeschool room is a little bit of a mess. And inside that homeschool room, we have a futon couch and it's heavy. It's wood. It's not like those flimsy metal ones. I got like a hard strong one because I have three boys and they have they have friends. Some of them are football players. They're big, they're big kids. They're all all their friends are big. And <clears throat> so my wife is taking that out of the room. Well she gets to this point in our house where there's a staircase. 
and she can't lift it. So she says, Judah, he's my oldest, plays football. Can you call one of your buddies to come over and pick up the couch and move it? See, there are moments in our life where we've got to say, I can't, can you help me? But here's what happens so many times in our life. We waste suffering. You see, God, he, is, he walks us through things. He helps us carry the weight that we might come alongside others and comfort and encourage other people as they walk through that encouragement. But when we sit on and hold on to our sufferings and don't let anybody else come in, then you know what? That suffering does get wasted. God doesn't want to waste your sufferings. The other day I was walking by at City View. We have these, your, I think your home groups, I can't remember what they're called, community groups or life groups, growth track. So at, at City View, we call them belong groups. Um, and it's groups where people can find belonging, find homes, like just find a place where they find community. And I was walking by one of our mom's belong groups that meets at City View. And I overheard one of the moms, this young mom, and she said, I wish this group was around when I had my first kid because I needed this encouragement. Because I've walked by where one of the moms who has kids a little older where she says, I've been there. You see, how your, your suffering gets wasted is when you watch somebody else walk through or you're unwilling to come alongside somebody else who's going through suffering. You're unwilling to share your own weakness, your own frailties, your own mistakes going, you know, I've made that business mistake. I, I've messed up as a parent. Yeah, my kids are all out of the house now, but let me tell you, it was tough when I was parenting my 16, my 14, my 10, my 5, my 2-year-old. You know, I, I look at the, the Belima household and they've got, they have a kid like every age for like five years and however many, uh, I lose track of how many kids because sometimes there's a new one at your house and, <laughs> uh, and I'm just like, that's hard. And it, it's as a parent, you know, especially when you have like, it's hard and you look going, man, am I the only one who wants to strangle my kid right now? Am I, am I the only one who wants to quit my job right now? Am I the only one who's going through this trouble in my marriage right now? Am I the only one who feels this? And when you keep it all to yourself, you're unwilling to allow God to use how he's comforted you to comfort others. But God's plan is that as you go through those hard times, that you're able to comfort others. So in that small group of moms, there's one mom able to encourage another mom saying, hey, you're doing a good job. Because one mom was willing to get vulnerable and say, I've been there, but God got me through it. You see, sometimes we are too embarrassed of what we've gone through. And we think no one wants to hear what I have to say. We think nobody's gone through what I've gone through. And all of a sudden, God can't comfort us. And all of a sudden, we isolate. You see, the devil loves to isolate. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, what was the first thing he did? He put guilt and shame so that they might isolate themselves and think they are all alone. That's the first thing he did. He built them up saying, hey, you can be like God. And then he said, no, look at you. Go hide. And they hid. And then God wasn't able to. He's like, where are you? Adam and Eve, where are you? And they said, well, we hid. Why? Because we were naked. Who told you? God pulls us out of isolation into community so that we might walk alongside one another to comfort others. And that's what Paul is talking about here. He's talking about this, this we go through sufferings, he says, who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we will be able to comfort those. He comforts you so that you can comfort others because it's this trip, it's this ripple effect. As God comforts you, you comfort them. As you get comforted, you comfort, then you comfort. And it's this thing that's meant to be lived in community of believers. But when we keep it to ourselves, that comfort gets wasted. But you know what? With God, your suffering is never wasted with him. Point three. Truth number three. God's comfort outweighs the world's suffering. God's comforts outweigh the world's suffering. Look at verse 5. For just as the suffering of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. 
See, suffering outweighs God's comfort when we don't turn to him. Suffering outweighs God's comfort when we don't allow God to pour into us. Suffering outweighs God's comfort when we try to bear it and do it on our own. Suffering outweighs God's comfort when we as men just, I'm just going to man up and I'm not going to admit I need any help. I'm just going to be a man. If that were Jesus, he wouldn't have gotten a hot mess of 12 men. Jesus goes, you know, I'm going to get 12 guys that have no clue what they're doing. You see, when we try to put a stranglehold on everything, we miss out on God being able to comfort us. God's comforts outweigh the world's suffering. It says here in verse 5, it says that it says that for just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through him. Abundant meaning overflowing. It, it's this, it's this, it's more than you can imagine or think. It's this, it's this outnumbering. There's no way of being able to count it. God's comfort is abundant. Jesus understands our sufferings. He gets you. He understands the hard times that you're going through. He understands the difficulties and the struggles that we go through. Look at some of these sufferings. I read this in a book, and I can't remember which book it was. But it talked about the sufferings that Jesus experienced in his life. The one thing, the first thing that it said here, it says, Jesus was born to an unwed mother. Jesus was born in a stable or the worst possible housing conditions. He was not born in some nice hospital bed or whatever. He was, he was born in a stable. Jesus was born to poor parents. Jesus, his life, he was constantly lived, threatened as a baby not living in a safe place. Jesus lived through such unimaginable sorrow and hurt and pain. Jesus had to move constantly, even as a young child. Jesus was put in this place. He was displaced. He was born in, in displacement. He had to move immediately out of fear of his life. Jesus' father died when he was a kid. Jesus had to support his mom, brothers, and sisters. Financially, Jesus said, I have no home and no place to lay my head. The religious, the people that he should have been able to trust the most were those who hated him the most. Jesus was told that he was insane. Jesus was told that he was demon-possessed. Jesus' own family went against him. We're getting ready for Thanksgiving and Christmas. Some of us, we know that our family situation is not what we want. Jesus gets it. Jesus was betrayed by one of his best friends. Jesus was tried and then sentenced to death by those that should have loved him. And then Jesus was killed by the people he came to die for, to give life for. Jesus gets your suffering. And it says, in his suffering, we have abundance of comfort. The closer we walk with God, the more we realize his comforts outweigh suffering. That doesn't mean suffering gets any lighter, but it gets easier. But the, the longer we walk with God and the more we look to him first, the quicker our suffering gets lighter off our shoulders because we start trusting him quicker. We realize that these truths, that, that God, you're not going to waste the suffering. And we, we look at the suffering, we look at the things we go through in life going, God, how is this ever going to work out? God, how is this ever going to be for your good? And there are some things in my life that I look at going, God, what, 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 why did you have me go through this? Well, I don't know, like I, I look at losing my house and I look at the good that came of it. My wife and I are now in a house that, man, it, I hate to tell you, we bought it for $150,000. It's in a nice community. Um, I know you can't buy anything, even a tank of gas here in California for $150,000. Um, but 
But it was out of that horrible suffering of losing, going through the financial, like, everybody, you can't. And then we now look going, God, thank you so much that we can live in this place. But I look at my son who almost died in India. He had, I said last service, he had three different bacterial infections in his blood. He had something called Shigella, typhoid, what would you have? Salmonella and typhoid fever. And like was, his blood was killing him. And we went to India to preach, my wife and I, not to preach, to encourage pastors who are going through terrible suffering, who are being persecuted for their faith, some being killed, being beat, their homes, their houses being burned down, their churches being destroyed. One pastor, she was forced to eat her own feces. And I'm there trying to encourage them, which I thought, man, who am I to encourage you? I've never been through. And that's one thing we struggle with is we compare our sufferings. We say, well, I I haven't gone through this, so I have nothing to say. No, 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 no. I would love to quiet you. You don't compare sufferings. Your sufferings are used to encourage, not discourage. To build up, not compare. Okay? But God, as you go through these sufferings, Jesus will comfort you through them. It's all dependent upon where you're looking. The fourth truth. Suffering produces trust in God. This is the tough one. Because this all depends upon where your eyes are looking. Whether your eyes are looking to God or whether your eyes are looking to yourself. Whether your eyes are only looking at your problem or God, or the God that is the God in your problem. Because he doesn't give up or quit on you. He's going to help you walk through it. Just like I said at the very beginning, he is the originator, the God of all mercies and the God of all comfort who's going to walk alongside you and get you through it. And as we remember and know those truths, this is the truth. Suffering produces trust in God. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. For we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction, which, we, which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively. I want you to, if you have your Bible, I don't know what translation you're reading, but Paul's going to use some key phrases here that, that are meaningful to us. He says, we were burdened excessively beyond our strength so that we despaired, even of life. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raised the dead, who delivered us from the great peril of death, and will deliver us, he on whom we have set our hope, and he will yet deliver us. Suffering is too much for us to carry, but not too much for God. Comfort is meant to take the burden off so that we could keep moving. So God wants to do. It says in the New Living, verse 8, it says, We think we, you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure, and we thought we would never live through it. So here's what Paul says about his suffering. He says, in suffering, I, it was excessive and crushing. Anybody ever been in suffering where it was excessive and crushing? You're like, I don't know if I'm going to get through it. In suffering, he said it was beyond my ability it was overwhelming to me in my suffering. In my suffering, I, w- I was in despair and thought I would die. Have you ever been in that moment of suffering? We're like, I don't know if I'm going to get through this. Parenting, I, I don't know how many of you are parents in here, but I'm, I'm parenting three boys right now with my wife. And we have our 16-year-old son who is, I love my, all my kids. I love all of them. My, my middle son said, don't tell all about the stuff he's done. Oh, yes. But there are moments where I look going, I, I, don't, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. My kids, they're good kids. My kids are good. They're great kids. They get speeding tickets just like you do. They do things that we shouldn't do just like we do. 
get bad grades and helping them get through. But there are moments where I look going, God, how am I going to make it through this 16, 17, 18? And with the current economy, God, he's never, they're never going to move out. But there have been multiple moments in my life where when my son was in the hospital, where my wife and I lost a home, where I felt exactly as Paul said, excessive and crushing. Where there are moments where a friend betrayed me and I felt beyond, like it was beyond what I could handle and I was overwhelmed. There are moments in my life where I was despairing and thinking, God, what, how, what is the way? And that, that's, Paul says, I've been there. He says, that's, I've been in that suffering. So what got him through it? Because that's what's key. We all have been there in that part. We all have been in that part where we've been despairing, but what got you through it? Some of us, it's like, well, I just had another drink, and I just forgot it. Or I just, I just manned up or womaned up, whatever you do, and I just kept trucking. And then all of a sudden, when you do that, when you keep doing that and you don't look to something greater than yourself and you do it on your own strength and your own ability, you keep doing it, the weight gets heavier because the weight never goes away, does it? How many of you have ever done that? You carry it, you're like, I'm just going to keep going and you keep going. I'm going to keep going and it gets heavier until at some point you either over-medicate, you do something you wish you never would have done, or you're so overwhelmed you hide in your home and you never come out. There are a lot of people right now that are still doing that. 2020 did such a wonder on them. They never looked to God. They just kept trucking. They kept isolating. They kept going into themselves. And they, they went through the same things Paul did. But what did Paul do that was different? He said there in verses 9 and 10, but in God. He looked to God. And what does he say about Jesus? He says, in God. Jesus, he raises the dead. That's what God does. He said, I may feel like I'm despairing, but God raises the dead. I may feel like I'm despairing, but God is my deliverer. He's going to get me out of this. I may feel like I'm despairing. I may feel like I'm so overwhelmed, but he says, but God is going to give me hope. His eyes stopped looking in, and they looked at God, who he knows is a dead razor. That's what God does. There's nothing too dead for him. He gives life. But man, the world would love to compound our suffering and just say, give up. And when we keep it to ourselves and we don't share with others and we don't walk alongside others, God can't use how he got you through. I know some of us, we, we're going through it now and we feel like you're, you're full of it. I would ask have you shared with anybody what you're going through? Because when we don't share, we're not giving somebody else the opportunity to be obedient and to comfort you. When you don't share with somebody going, man, I'm, I'm really struggling in my work right now. I hate my job. When you're unwilling to be open, you're hindering God from being able to say, but this person can tell you they've been there and they can tell you how they got through it because the words they're going to say is exactly what you need to hear. But when we're unwilling to be vulnerable, and Paul, Peter's like, oh, not Peter, Paul's like, man, I was excessive, I was beyond, I was overwhelmed, I was despairing, but Jesus raises the dead. This is where Paul builds his trust. There's a couple at City View, husband and wife, um, Tony is my, he's my executive pastor. Their daughter, um, she was a twin, and one of the twins died in the womb. The doctors told them to have an abortion on both of them. <clears throat> and they said, no, we can't. And so they decided to still have, and they said, well, if you have your other daughter, she will be mentally disabled. And we don't know how long she'll live or what kind of life she will have, but it will be a terrible life for her. And they said, okay, we understand. So they chose to have little Maya. Maya's in a wheelchair. She can't really communicate. She can't walk. There are times she's now, she's a little younger than Joel. I think she's 13. There are times when Tony will text me, hey, I'm not going to come into the office today. Maya hasn't slept in 72 hours. 
when she doesn't sleep, nobody sleeps because she screams all day long. Yet what's amazing about them is their trust in God because he's the only one that gets them through it because they look going, we're crushed, we're despairing, we're overwhelmed, but God. And so I watch their trust in God grow with every single lack of 72-hour sleep, with every single hospital visit, with every single burden and suffering, I watch them grow because that's what happens when your eyes look to God saying, but God, you are the one who gives life. You are the one who gives hope, and you are the one who is the deliverer. The fifth and final truth that I found here in 2 Corinthians is prayer is the natural response to godly suffering. Verse 11. <clears throat> you also joining in helping us through your prayers so that thanks may be given by the many persons on our behalf for the favor bestowed on us through the prayers of many. As we go through suffering, crying out to God should be what we do. Asking others for prayer should be what we do. Believing that prayer is powerful. Believing that prayer works. Believing that prayer moves the heart of God. Believing that God listens to our prayers. Actually stopping and praying for people. This, when our focus is praying, when our focus is, God, I need to talk to you. God, you need to be the one that hears my voice. God, I need to cry. I have no, nobody else to cry out to right now. That when our focus is on him, he gets us through our suffering. How many of you have ever said this to a person at church before? And they, they're telling you about what they're going through. And you say, I'll pray for you. Anybody ever do that? Raise your hand. I, I want all of us. How many of you have done that before? You heard somebody, you're like, I'll pray for you. And now, okay. How many of you have ever forgotten to pray for that person? Be real right now. Don't lie. If you don't raise your hand, I know you're lying. <laughs> How many of you have ever forgotten? You told somebody at church. You said, oh, you're, I'm sorry you're going through that. I'll pray for you. And you go home, and all of a sudden your kids go, what's for lunch? You go home, you're like, oh, I forgot, I got to get gas on my way home. You come the next week, and that person comes up to you and says, hey, thank you so much for praying for me. And you go, your, your next response is a lie. You're welcome. <laughs> but, but what if we change that? What if you're telling me everything you're going through, and I say, hey, let's pray right now. Imagine if this place, every Sunday, people saw that happening. Because all of a sudden, we're all going to go through suffering, aren't we? That's the reality. Like, you can't avoid it. You can avoid some suffering. Like, I didn't have to run that half marathon. But I couldn't avoid what was going on with my kid. Prayer should be the natural response. Paul says, as Paul is saying to his church, he's saying, we need to be praying for each other. The closer we walk with God and grow in these truths, our prayer life should grow as well. You see, prayer keeps your eyes looking up. Worry keeps your eyes looking at the ground. When you are in that prayer focus, whether it's praying with others, your, your eyes, as you're going through the suffering, going, God, I need your help right now. God, I can't do this. Your eyes are looking up. You're focused on him going, God, I need you because you're bigger than this problem. You, you're going to get me through this. And so prayer looks up, but worry looks down. And when you look down, you can't see what's coming. I do a side hustle in Phoenix. I, I, do, I spray houses for bugs a couple times a month. It's just fun. It's just a fun little job for me. It's a job, you walk in and you, you start at one point of the house and you just do a circle or square, whatever the shape of the house. It's not a circle. I've never sprayed a circle house, but it's a <laughs> the shape of a house. There's this one house, I've done it multiple times. And I'm so focused on the ground. 
and I'm coming around this corner, and on the corner of the patio is a big old TV. And I'm hustling. It's hot in Phoenix. And I want to get into my truck with the air conditioning. It's like 115 outside. And I come around this corner. I run right into the TV, about to knock myself out. When we're so focused on our own selves, we will run into more and more problems. But when we are focused on God, God will help us see what's coming. Sometimes the suffering is unavoidable. Sometimes it is. Prayer keeps your eyes looking up. As you pray, it starts changing your focus. It helps you put things into perspective that God is working. If we just make these five truths, something that we remember, we're just remembering the truths of, okay, God, you, you're not going to waste the suffering. Okay, God, you're, you're going to get me through it. God, you are the God of all mercies and comfort. God, show me this. Okay, okay, God, you are, you are going to walk me through these, these things. Okay, God, you're gonna, your comforts are going to outweigh the sufferings the world's going to bring. Okay, God, and as we focus on those things, You'd be amazed at what you see God do at the end. Because then you have this heavenly perspective that God has a bigger thing he's doing than just the suffering you're walking through. Like I said at the beginning, comfort can be found in all suffering. It can. And in that comfort... God wants to use it so that you might comfort others. Don't waste it. Let that comfort that God has gotten you through, let him use it because he's going to get somebody else through too. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for being the God of all comfort, the God of all mercy, the God of all good things. God, I thank you that you don't waste our sufferings, our worries, our struggles, our hard times, God. But you are a good God who does good things in awesome ways. And Lord, I ask, God, that for those of us who are walking through things that we just can't handle right now, Lord, may we look to you, the one who raises the dead, the one who delivers, and the one who gives hope. Jesus, may our eyes look to you the author and perfecter of our faith. In Jesus' name, amen.